Dr. Sharice Griffith-Charles is a senior lecturer at the Department of Geomatics Engineering and Land Management at the University of West Indies in the Caribbean. She will speak on informal settlement regularization, disaster management and small island developing states since using the extensive work she has done on this in the field. I'll be talking about land tenure, land surveying and climate change in Caribbean small island developing states. So just speak briefly about the land characteristics in the Caribbean, the SIDS land characteristics, and the impacts of climate change in the Caribbean. And then talk a bit, little bit about the land tenure regularization disaster management projects in SIDS. And finally about the geomatics response to climate change. So the land, of course, is Islands are, are quite small, so you have that size issue. There's not a lot of land to allocate to the populations. And also that, that will therefore impact on how we can provide for mitigation strategies. Um, I saw quite a bit of, of solar farms and wind farms in the previous two presentations. And we do have a couple of them that, that are sort of rudimentary um, experimental and then nowhere near that scale, of course. So that will uh, impact on what we can do for climate change. The population density as well, it, we have large, well, relatively um, dense populations in the Caribbean. And we're talking about the range 200 to 300, which may not be the most populous countries, but certainly there are less populous countries you can compare not with uk it's probably on the same level but in the us it's probably about 35 40 something to, um as a comparison so because of that again there's not much land to allocate to persons uh land tenure is affected and um we have dependent economies very restricted markets small scale markets as we saw uh, in the previous presentation from Kate, they had to look at niche markets like some boutique teas. Uh, we have to look at that type of things. We cannot compete in terms of volume and scale with larger markets because we have limited resources. And whatever happens to economies outside globally will impact on our economies. We import a lot of what we use. We also have vulnerability to natural hazards, which become exacerbated because of climate change. And that is impacted as well by the geography. And land and resource management, of course, there are conflicts over the limited land in terms of tenure and use. The same land that is available and best for agriculture might be the same land that is available and the best for residential use. And institutional capacities, we have small institutions that have to manage land to perform land administration, and they're limited in terms of their resources and lacking in capacity. While we at the university are um, building capacity in land administration, land management, planning, et cetera, uh, we also see, and we have been doing that for quite a few years, we also see a brain drain of people who go to more opportunities in developed countries. So we still have to keep doing that. The geomorphology, as I mentioned, the, uh, is limited land and uh, many of the countries have this volcanic shape, which means slopes that will be um, more vulnerable to slipping and causing floods and um, limited coastal areas where everybody can use. Uh, the slopes are usually occupied as still for residential, for uh, agricultural purposes. And that just makes the, the flooding and the, the land slippage worse. The history, we have uh, a shared history of colonization, which has resulted in terms of land, in uh, disparity in terms of land holding, both in terms of size and um, the arable lands, whether the capacity of the land. 
to perform different agricultural purposes or other types of land use. And we have family land from the history and the, the lack of access to land. We have a lot of family land where people have passed on land through generations, but there's no security of tenure, no documentary security of tenure that says they, they own the land. And then we have spontaneous occupation. There's a lot of an informality. There's a lot of uh, state land and people occupy spontaneously and uh, um, informally. But there's also spontaneous occupation on private land as well, which is not, which needs to be regularized. So these things impact, as I said, uh, the climate change impacts would be flooding, landslides, and these would continue and be uh, exacerbated by climate change. So we have to anticipate how we will deal with the tenure issues that this causes. And the species changes, the climate change also causes species changes. Uh, we see some sargassum seaweed. We've had a lot of that and that impacts as well on our ability to uh, use tourism as a form of income. But we also have invasive species like other invasive species like lionfish, et cetera. So all those things impact on the ability to have livelihoods in the sea environment, the marine environment, and on land as well. The storm surges, those are getting worse with, climate, with sea level rise, and then hurricanes as well have been getting stronger. Um, although I see that they, they are moving a little northward, so maybe we won't be as impacted as badly. But you see here some pictures of, of actual impacts of um, land slippage, flooding, um, impacts on the, the infrastructure that needs to be recovered, especially in a limited economy. So some of the um, informal tenure regularization that have occurred and disaster management in the Caribbean, I'll look at a little bit at the regularization using systematic adjudication and titling in St. Lucia and regularization using the social tenant domain model in St. Lucia and St. Vincent and the Grenadines, some, a pilot project that was done, and regularization using fit for purpose land administration in Trinidad and Tobago, which is just a proposal and not being taken up really, and disaster management in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So in St. Lucia, there was systematic adjudication and titling done in the 80s. It was very successful. But some years afterwards, uh, we had to look at how that was done and whether the way it was done achieved the outcomes that were um, proposed at that time. They expected, they anticipated that the systematic adjudication and titling would result in uh, a, a very vibrant land market, uh, use of credit, uh, opportunities to, to develop entrepreneurial activities, uh, commercial activities, but that did not happen um, in the way it was. It, it was predicted to the, because of the availability, lack of, of credit, and credit institutions, the economy and the, the economic environment would restrict that from occurring at the end of the, uh, as an outcome of systematic adjudication and titling. But you also have um, the lack of opportunities could also restrict the land market uh, if you only have certain things like tourism to, as an opportunity, it would restrict the land activity in the land market. And then lack of insurance, even agricultural use. If you don't have agricultural insurance with um, landslides and flooding impacting the agricultural sector, you won't have the ability to recover. But we can also see in terms of the appropriateness of land-related legislation, in many instances, the legislation is really imported from developed countries 
Uh, but in this case, they actually titled a lot of people in terms in the name of the family. So family land groups were able to be titled, and this was very a very positive aspect. And appropriateness of land-related policies, that also impacts on whether you get to uh, the growth and the land market. Of course, it costs and, and of titling registration and transaction registration would impact on the ability of the people who now are titled to register their inheritances and other transactions. And whether you do systematic or sporadic, voluntary or compulsory titling can also impact on what the outcomes are. Other countries in the Caribbean, like Jamaica, have has been doing um, systematic, but it's been voluntary or compulsory, sometimes sporadic. So, and with varying degrees of outcomes or positive outcomes or success, uh, Barbados as well, and um, Trinidad and Tobago is still to begin its, its compulsory um, titling. So some things are to, good to be learned from their process. The social tenant domain model was applied in St. Lucia and St. Vincent in a pilot project. And it was hoped that this, since the success of those pilot projects, that it would be scaled up to the country. But you have the risk of whether the society will accept the, the use of this social tenant domain model. Uh, which is uh, uh, both a, a concept and a software to quickly um, record in situ where, what tenure people have without necessarily going to the rigid processes of compulsory titling. The, so the, the society has to accept it since it is a, a new process. It is less rigid, less technical, um, they may feel it is not as good as the systematic adjudication and titling. Uh, the institutions have to accept it. And in speaking with the institutions, remember they are people by people from the community themselves, communities themselves. And they look at it as accepting illegality where they have to now fund their own acquisition of land. There are people who have been um, occupying land and now getting their tenure recorded. So the institutions have to accept it if they are now going to be the ones to upscale it to the entire country. So we have we also have technical challenges and opportunities to pass on the build the capacity of the institutions and also the communities to scale up the project into the, the country. And that could, could be difficult. And resource requirements, if the state is going to have to manage the scaling up, they're going to look at what is the, the cost of um, scaling up this project. Disaster management, uh, this was from uh, some research done in St. Vincent and Grenadine, Grenadines, and it was compa comparing the ability of different communities, ones that were, had tenure security and ones that didn't have tenure security, to prepare, respond, and recover from disaster, which would be impacting um, even more with climate change. And of course, it was found that there was a disparity in the ability to prepare the using um, drainage and um, walls, retaining walls, etc., between the, the different communities to respond when the disaster hit and to recover after the, the disaster. Uh, lack of an ability to use the tenure to get access to credit to rebuild and to recover. So of course that, that happened. So we would need to identify climate change risks where they occur, whether it's locally in little communities or whether it's on a national scale, um, identify what would happen when there's this, um, this risk occurring, this hazard occurring, 
the what will will be lost the loss of the knowledge if it is not recorded the persons who would probably die from the the damage would lose you would lose that that information on who was occupying where you have damaged the records and also complete loss of records and that can happen at a limited scale and also on a national scale so that needs to be managed um we would have to respond by going out now and recording that information duplicating and archiving that information and making sure that knowledge is not lost in the event of a disaster and we need to do that as climate change is exacerbating these hazards and then we have to identify what whose responsibilities are there. We need to support the individuals and the communities in being able to record their information, record their, their data on their tenure. And um, also in amongst the, the SIDS themselves, they can also look at providing that data, supporting each other in um, storing that data, archiving that data. I know most people would say, well, we can store it on the cloud, but we've been having so many cyber attacks. Cyber security is a, a, a major issue, and we're talking about large scale data in terms of the countries. If we're talking about land tenure for the entire country, and it, it will have to be very securely kept, securely managed. And well, lastly, the Fit for Purpose Land Administration. Um, proposal for Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, we've had legislation for more than 20 years for the systematic adjudication and titling, but it has gone, the state has gone back and forth in what they would need to do with the, uh, the more than 300,000 individuals who are on state land um, and there are also people on occupying private land. And while Initially, initially, the legislation accepted that these people could be titled since they had been in occupation for more 30, 40, even more years. Um, the state keeps amending the legislation. And the last amendment said that the people, even though they were occupying state land for 30, 40 years, they would not be titled. It would be titled in the name of the state. So even if you were to implement the adjudication and titling, um, now, it would result in just the same number of people occupying state land without any uh, any title. So again, you need to have, like in previous cases, societal acceptance of this less rigid documentation if you apply a fit-for-purpose land administration, which would mean that you are lowering the, the rigid expectations of documentation of, of precision surveying. Um, and you also need to get the professionals on board. And speaking with my fellow surveyors, land surveyors, a lot of them don't accept that they need to lower their standards. They're accustomed to being very precise and it's, um, they don't want to, to lower their standards so it's fit for purpose land administration. So it's a lot of building awareness and showing them the, the benefits of at least having a comprehensive uh, survey, uh, comprehensive data, instead of having very small scale, but um, very complex and very rigid procedures. And well, there'll be technical challenges and opportunities, uh, both for determining what is the minimum uh, requirements that we need to get to this comprehensive data. And uh, what are the resource requirements and the costs? Uh, although those are things that we can probably um, attract the state with, that it would be a touch lower cost, so much lower in cost than a rigid process. So what is the geomatics response to climate change? We need to be able to be, to be the ones to determine specifications for data quality and access, precision. There is, there is yes. a new up now. Right, so this is the last bit. I'll just sum up. These are some of the things that the land surveyors, the geomatics people are supposed to do, including making tenure and mapping a central component of national climate change strategies and plans, and even for the valuation surveyors, 
to integrate the land tenure rights and the value of these rights into any loss and damage discussion of where we are going with the climate change. So thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a, a, a real insight into all the aspects that have to be covered um, in a SIDS environment. Thank you very much for that. Um,